<laughs> it's backwards. Edward Anderson, welcome aboard. How are you? NY DLS30, you're a familiar face. Tuck Garage, hey, buddy. How are you? How's things out in the uh, rest of the world? Hey, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Ah. <laughs> you like that shirt? <laughs> it's Salute Cho. That's it. That's his new name to me now. Slut Cho. Now I'm going to find out that, that means something that we don't necessarily want it to mean. See, what time is it out there in the California? It's uh, 10 a.m., right? Somebody get that guy on here. Hey, Chris, how are you? It was fun bantering with you earlier. That camera looks greasy. It's Mandarin for Grinderlicious. <laughs> okay, you're out of control, sir, and I like it. Yeah, just close your eyes. Oh, oh, that's a little better. So, uh, happy Sunday. It is a gorgeous day in the New Hampshire. Um, sun is shining. The temperature is perfect. With one minor problem. The pine trees, and I'm told they do this every year, uh, the pine trees are dumping pollen in billowing clouds. Uh, I posted a picture. Um, hi, Ethan. Uh, I posted a picture earlier of the top of my car, and it is a red car, <laughs> except today it's yellow. Hey, there he is. Machine Shop 10 E. Welcome aboard, sir. Dan, how are you? Hey, uh, how is it down in the Cambridge? Are we having a nice day down in the Cambridge? Oh, well, uh, I am a good learner of AutoCAD 2D and 3D. So you're studying AutoCAD? Well, keep it up. If there's any requirements designing, then please tell me. I'll keep you in mind, buddy. So, uh, oh, it's, yeah, down by the Charles, the muddy Charles. So it is, it's really beautiful here. No fooling. And it really is a gorgeous day, but the pollen is horrible. So I ended up, hey, Wes, I ended up uh, getting some, a bunch of stuff done, but I was painting, shop rearranging. Yeah, while it's cool. Hey, Octane, how are you? So I ended up painting some uh, hand uh, rails uh, in front of the house. And I had my respirator on, which made it look like I was wearing it. Uh, hey, Alex Cinco, welcome aboard. It, it looked like I was wearing my respirator for the paint, but I was wearing my respirator for the pollen. It was awful, but... We uh, we survived, so uh, it's been a weird week. I, the the uh, the day job had me really busy at the end of the week, right to the end of the day on Friday. I didn't usually. I'm in the shop on Fridays, so there was no shop time on Fridays. And then there's been um, domestic projects. I'm reading your thing, uh, Dan. You're gonna get a faro arm. Metal printer, five axis wire EDM. Bah! Awesome. I'm going to come down and play. If, I'll, I'll wear, if I wear my ring and I bring my old student ID card, can I play? <laughs> uh, hey, Ukraine, welcome. Yes, I, I remember now that you're in Ukraine. I hope, I hope you and yours are okay, and I wish I could do more to help from here. So if I can, you let me know. Um, 
informational classes from Massimo. You're like, oh, cool. That sounds awesome. Dan, that's awesome. I will come down and hold your chip bucket. Uh, Shariah Shar... I can't pronounce it. Shariar Molding. Welcome. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> you got the old Mazak up to 100%. Is that 100% speeds and feeds or 100% like it's feeling good? Good to hear, Alec. So, uh, yeah, so I didn't get any I didn't get any shop time on Friday and this has been a non-shop a uh, couple of days, but I got a ton done. Um I did plumbing, I did burning. We had a bunch of stuff we had to burn. Um painting a computer computer ordering <laughs> I, I designed a computer for myself uh, and ordered the pieces and that was exciting so yeah just tons of stuff oh and the ham radio station got a little bit of love uh, so just it got a new computer all the computers shift here right so when when I get a new computer my old office computer goes down to the ham radio station so it was a big shift left and uh, so there was some time there so what are you guys doing in the shop uh, this week I'm reading your thing Dan live tune boy you imported it from building three <laughs> dude how much did the uh, import duty cost on that if you guys aren't following, uh, Dan works in a place that I used to be associated with, so I'm giving him some grief. I I don't. It's not my place to identify uh, the details. Hey, Purdy, Ethan is moving all projects to a new apartment. Yeah, moving. Well, I hope it works out. Is it bigger? You're gonna have more room for your projects. Because all projects grow to uh, fill all available space. Scraping, scraping, scraping. Good. As long as you're staying level. Okay, I'm allowed to say that? Yeah. So uh, the, machine, the machine shop 10 E is at MIT, which is the, uh, a small technical school on the, sh on the uh, Charles River down in Cambridge, Mass. So, uh, what, I think I saw a bunch of your scraping pictures. And NYDLS30 is doing shop work, trying to optimize workflow. Interested in hearing others' processes for file naming and tool management. Isn't tool management always the thing? Um, so, the only thing I can add to that discussion, maybe some other folks are going to pop up, is that when I do file names, I will frequently put a date code in the file name and not depend on any of the dates in the met metadata for the file. So I'll do a year, you know, four digit year and then a four digit month and month and day when I save a file. And if things are crazy, I'll add a four digit time code to that. So it sounds like a lot of trouble, but it 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 can save you if things get confusing. Tuck Garage says, get a label maker for tool management. Use more space than you need for growth too. So I have adopted the, um, the Pearson uh, tool tag habit. And I actually built a 16 slot tool tag cradle uh, with a magnet on the back which sits on the CNC. If somebody asks me to, I will go get it and I will show it to you. But those yellow, uh, it doesn't have to be yellow, but those tool tags, you could buy them in bulk, that they're injection molded, or you could 3D print your own uh, that go on the tool. So when it comes out of the machine, tool tag goes on it. Tool tag has a descriptor and it has the tool length uh, written right on it. So you can pick that tool up, put it right back in the machine, enter that number, and, and go to work. That's what I've been doing.
Five or six character file in Hus. Yeah, the tool tags are pretty cool. Um, uh, Pearson Workholding released, I think they released their 3D file for their tool tag holder, but it was a 20, I think it was a 24 uh, slot tool tag holder, and I respun it. Actually, I designed it from scratch. So actually, I'm not sure if they released it. But anyway, if anybody wants it, I will send you or I'll post to one of the appropriate libraries my 16-slot uh, tool tag holder. Oh, tool drawers. Yeah, I don't have a good solution. <laughs> you know who has a good solution? is, uh, And he's not here because he's out in the sunshine working on his property, I'm sure. Is uh, Adam at MHM uh, Machine Works or MHM Machining, I think he calls it. Uh, Adam has a really nice design for a 3D printed cradle for a uh, lay down uh, Cat 40 tool holder. And then on the edges, they lock into each other. So you could fill a drawer with these things and your tools can lay down in a drawer. It's really, yes, not Adam the Machinist, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, MHM, that's Mike Hotel Mike. MHM Machining. He's on Instagram, um, but not right now. Yeah, so Purdy Ethan says, metadata dates can be changed by a lot of different things. On, on my work PC, there is a hotkey that spits out the date and time for file names and notes. That's cool. There's a lot of apps that do not have a way to spit out a time uh, a date and time code, and I really wish there were. Um uh, but I, I'm in the habit of time stamping everything, and that has saved me in the past. Yep. Uh, NYDLS30 says, have posts set up for time and date and source file and header. So especially for post processors, um, that date stamp is really important because you make an improvement, you save it, you make an improvement, you save it. And then the question is, which post did I use? So I really like uh, time and, and date stamping. Absolutely. So, uh, so what else is going on? What, are you, what else are you guys working on? I haven't heard from uh, Ox Tools in a while. I, I know he's working on getting his shop up and running. Plus, he's busy at the, at the uh, salt mines. So hope to hear from him soon. I'm wearing I'm wearing this shirt uh, in his honor. <laughs> Plus, my other shirt was really sweaty. NYDLS30 says, "Do others save files on control or offline?" So um, the controls don't have enough. My control. So I, I have uh, I have a Fanuc control on my vertical machining center. And it has Fanuc memory disease, which means it doesn't have any memory. So if you try to save all your files on the control, you run out of memory. It's, it's not good. So uh, I try to, to not have uh, files on the control. Whereas you can have, you, you can have uh, Niddles. Niddles 30. You got it, buddy. <laughs> Let it be written. Let it be said, let it be done. So uh, you could have a zillion files on on a flashcard and you can even drip from the flashcard. That works. Hey, Bart. Um, but I tend to keep everything on the computer and then I write it to the, to the card and, and go. And then if I have to do it again, I do it again. One gigabyte on the next gen. That's impressive, actually. Recently purged to only files for use in current work. Yeah, if you have, if you have a gigabyte in the control, life changes totally. Um, I started the la uh, which project was it? it uh, yeah, it was. A, it, it doesn't matter which project it was. I started using three D tool paths. I was sort of encouraged that hey, this might be a good way to go. And the first thing I notice is that the 3D toolpaths, even if you're not doing a 3D, you know, um, a 3D surface, 
eat memory for breakfast. So it was pretty impressive how big those files got and how fast. Um, so what are you up to today, Bart? Uh, nice, nice post, Bart, on balancing your wheels using an improvised uh, system. Um, that's exactly how I balanced my wheels when I started. I used, uh, I used a stack of, of two, one, two, three blocks in the, in the two inch dimension, two of them. And I did exactly what you did. And, and here's a, here's a quick, tr uh, uh, tip. I took copper wire and bent it into the, into a U shape. And I dropped that into the end holes so that when the arbor hit the end, it wouldn't roll off the one, two, three blocks. That one's free. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, Niddles thirty is uh, is is getting sorted out. Archive folder for each customer with old versions. Yes, I I have that on my system. Also, every mostly for other kinds of files, but. Every client has a has a file. WDO Cunningham, welcome aboard, sir. And Hanji, welcome. Um, yeah, we have well because I my office is upstairs. I use a file uh, uh, a NAS network attached storage file server, so that ultimately is the library. You have to level the plate, right? <laughs> That's the hard part. So my uh, my big plate is on three three screws, so I was able to level my plate within an inch of its life, and then. Uh, so I'll teach you a trick. I you all, you probably already know the trick because it, intuitively, but if if the wheel hey there's almost welcome aboard sir, if the wheel is moving but it's not oscillating, you know, if it's not fast and slow and fast and slow, then you might be just tilted. So you sort of can filter out uh, the difference between tilt and imbalance. The only thing you can't quite filter out is if the block you're using is not flat um, and, and even, if, even, though, even though it's not level, but if, if it's if it's got a, a belly in the block, which is not going to happen because you're not going to do that, uh, it could mimic it could mimic uh, an out of balance condition, even though it's balanced. So the block has to be flat. But if it's a little teeny weeny bit out of level, you can sort of mentally filter that out as you're balancing. So uh, yeah. And it's still on my list to finish that project and get the balancing stands out. Um, the balance table with bearing wheels, do they need to be level? So uh, I think you mean the, the stands that you see commonly, shaft balancing stands that have the two great big wheels that overlap and then they have bearings. Do they need to be level? Well, they need to be level in this axis, not mostly just to make things work smoothly, but they do not need to be level. Okay, so you could be you could be sitting on a floor <laughs> that's like this, and you put your stand down. It's not level, right? But it will tell you about imbalance in the wheel for sure. Um, one, one here's a trick. I'll give you a, a, a trick. Um, hey Mike, welcome aboard. You could, if, if you have a wheel and you're not sure what's going on, take a piece of uh, masking tape or electrical tape or duct tape, pick your favorite tape and just put a, just put a, a layer of tape on the wheel. In other words, create a known imbalance. Okay. And then go up to your balancing mechanism. Doesn't matter what it is and look how it behaves and it will tell you a lot. Um, and once you're, you know, you've made, you know, here's another, hang on. I didn't even have to go far for this one. <laughs> put, put one of these on your wheel. Wonk. Okay. Now 
you know the wheels are balanced, and now you can kind of convince yourself that everything's cool. Because if you're if you're on a, a, a wickedly out of level surface, and you put an imbalance on there, and you see here's your here's your balancing stand. I'm I'm depicting the one you're referring to, and your and your the weight you just added is hanging over here. You can kind of and I'm exaggerating for effect, but you can kind of say, hmm, maybe. Maybe something's wrong, but at the very least, you could find out where you know where level is, and um, and everything kind of behaves, and then you can you can go to town. Yeah, put it on and see the difference in surface finish. That's a that's a very slow way to level. <laughs> Just take a cut, take a look at your surface, hit it with the PFG stones. It will all those high spots will blossom. And then, uh, and then uh, do it again and see what happens. Not good. Yeah, that could take a while. Um, well, you know, how does the uh, how do the automatic balancers work? They're measuring a vibration, and they know they have an absolute encoder, so they know where the vibration is happening on the wheel. And fun fact, it's measuring the vibration. 90 degrees out of phase. Don't ask me why I remember this, but um, it, then it processes it and then it says, okay, I know where, I know where the balancing goes. Um, another place that uses balancing and does it uh, the way I just described is in aircraft propellers. So your, your favorite aircraft mechanic uh, may may be balancing your prop, your propeller, and they use a strobe light and a little reflective uh, ducus on on the uh, hub and a a sensor on the on the engine, and it could measure the vibration. And the the machine, they just they ju you just run it. The machine will say you need a weight in this direction. And this amount, and they'll take a a washer, and they'll put a washer under one of the bolts of the appropriate weight, retorque everything, run it again, and they'll keep doing that until the system says the imbalance is below a certain limit. Um, and I know that because I had an airplane, and my mechanic had the magic box. Yes, similar to wheel vehicle. Uh, Wheel. So if you go to get your car wheels balanced and you get dynamic balancing, that's exactly what's going on. It's just a little less elegant. How do you clean, Niddles 30 says, how do you clean PFGs? I have a Stefan uh, Gottswinter set from the trip over there, but getting a little loaded up dirty. Well, you know, Stefan stones get dirty. PFGs don't. So uh, I wish Stefan was here. Um, we could give him more grief. Uh, so there's a million ways to to do it. My favorite way, if they get really grimy, is is ultrasonic. Um, Dawn dish soap, water, ultrasonic. Um, I, I've gotten away without putting. I put them on edge, right? And I've gotten away with putting without putting anything under them, but you can also take two two wooden dowels and and put them chopsticks. Use the chopsticks, the ones you were going to throw away from Thursday night's dinner. Yeah, rinse them off. Put them down. Lay the stone on top of it inside your ultrasonic, and run that baby. Okay. The one thing you have to remember though about the ultrasonic is it's also going to bleed out. Um, it's also going to bleed out some of the oil that's uh, impregnated in the stones. This is fine. It's not going to hurt anything. But you're going to see that float out of the stone. Do not panic. You also don't have to ultrasonic it for seven days. Just give it give it 15 minutes and, uh, and you should be good to go. So 
uh, you'll be removing probably some of the oil from the stone. You don't have to put it back uh, for the purposes of a PFG stone and a Stefan stone or a Stefan stone. Um, uh, we don't care about the oil. That The oil is not important to us. So that's a really good way to clean them. Uh, a way that I've played with, others have recommended, um, and then, then I'm going to get to one that I tested that's really slick. Another way to do it is uh, WD-40 and a piece of corrugated cardboard from your Amazon box, right? And uh, uh, saturate it with WD-40 and rub the stone on it, and it does a pretty impressive job. Um, so that's another way to do it. Again, dirt cheap, easy, can't hurt the stone. Um, and then the way I experimented with, which I liked a lot, is I take a, uh, <laughs> I have props ready. I take a tray, okay, and I, I, uh, I take some paper towels. I like two layers of paper towels on the tray. And now I, I take my sprayer, which is over there, um, and I spray it and I soak it with denatured alcohol. You can also use isopropyl. And then I do something that's really lazy. I take the stone and I sit it down on top of the saturated paper towel and I go away. And it's pretty amazing. Uh, the, the gunge tends to come out and it's, it's just slow and you're not, you can't possibly uh, hurt anything. Yeah, Pragmatic Machinist, Chris says, hose your stones down with double, U, double your D40, <laughs> rub on cardboard, done. He's right, yeah. That seems to be a pretty cool way to do it. Again, my favorite, Ultrasonic Dawn. Oh, by the way, if you don't have an Ultrasonic, uh, hang on. If you don't have an ultrasonic, take a little tub, uh, a good healthy squirt of Dawn uh, detergent, fill it up with hot water, get yourself one of these, okay, and just scrub your stone with it under the, under the Dawn, rinse it really well, and drip dry. Okay, and I, I endorse that method because that's actually what I do before I ship you your PFG stones. They get washed with Dawn, okay, and then they get a quick, uh, a quick spray with um, uh, denatured alcohol, and they go out the door. Yeah, Wes Piley says if you don't have an ultrasonic, Get an ultrasonic. You're not wrong, sir. I've got a little one and a big one. Hey, Alex. Welcome aboard. Niddles30 says... Okay, I don't understand. He says he tried the dub D and C board <laughs> and got the heebie-jeebies like I had on a trip on to Missouri. I think what you're telling me is that it actually worked, but the cardboard looked disgusting when you were done. Am I correct? I think that's what you mean. Anyway, all of these methods work, and none of them are going to hurt the stone. Here's what not to do to your stone. Don't get out that stiff stainless steel brush and go at it like... You know, it, it's the last thing in the world. Yeah, okay. Um, don't do that. Uh, don't put it in the dishwasher. Don't do that. That's going to have, like, thermal cycles that I, I who knows what's going to happen. I don't want to find out. So those are your methods. You got. Th I've given you three methods. The, the guys have confirmed a couple of them. Let it rip. Hope that answers the question. Let's see. Were there any other? Did I miss any questions? Nobody put a question in the uh, in the doobly doo. So uh, I'm running out of questions here, guys. Come on. 
Ask me anything. Double thumbs up from Niddles30. That's, that's what I live for. JLJ Machining has joined. Welcome aboard, sir. So what else you guys got cooking? <sighs> I am hoping that this particular work project that I have, I can put a, a sword in its heart like Monday or Tuesday and I can actually come in here and do some machining because that's what I really would like to do. We have a question that popped in. Oh, this is a great question. Bart, was this a real question or you, is this a setup? Bart Harkama says, do you dress the sides of your wheels? And Bart, the answer is yes. Absolutely yes. Uh, am I a motorcycle person? I'm going to answer that real quick, then I'm going to get back to Bart's wheels. I am a rated motorcyclist. I have not motorcycled in a long time. I owned... I'm going to say I, I owned a, a, a Honda CB400, which is a little bike which was wonderful. I drove it um, up to Canada and back. I had a good time with it. And then, uh, no setup. Okay, good. We're going to talk about size of wheels. Uh, and then I had to babysit a BMW K, K series for a year and a half. Oh, poor me. And then, and then that was the last motorcycling I did. So I am in favor of the motorcycle. I just don't have one right now. Uh, Flood City. <laughs> Flood City says, he went camping with the family and the guy in the site next to me looked exactly like you. I had to do a double take. Then I remember, you don't live, in, you don't live near Western Pennsylvania. I'm neither going to confirm nor deny whether I was in Western Pennsylvania. Okay, let's get down to addressing the wheel. Bart says, I did dress balance dress, but I'm not happy with the surface finish. Didn't do the sides. Okay, I am of the opinion that, well, let's, let's take the short version. The short version is dress the sides of your wheel. If you go to watch the video I did on wheel balancing it may not have been obvious but I did advocate dressing the sides of the wheel so let me show you um, yeah you see it dressed not dressed who is that job shop machining welcome aboard sir uh, there's one that's even better dressed and then there's a little step you can't see it but I could feel it not dressed so I dress that much of the of, of the wheel it's easy easy peasy um, and Bart what you can do I will show you my my dresser that I use for that this is this is extremely complicated but for a small fee I will send you a drawing of this this is a block of steel. <laughs> you drill a hole right there. For extra credit, you could grind it all over. Okay. And then you have a set screw. Um, and make sure you stamp your initials underneath the set screw. Okay. And then you have your diamond, single diamond. So this thing is really cool because you could, you could plop it down on your table, you could dress your wheel, you can rotate it. It's really obvious which which side of your diamond you used because this thing is sticking out. But also, watch this, my fingers will not leave my hands. You could set it on the table like this and you can dress the side of your wheel. So this is, I, I use this, I, I still use it when I need it. Um, I've used this for years. Now, now, here's the interesting thing. Once you've done that one inch of, of dressing the wheel, or you can go all the way as far as you want, 
and you get that nice and flat, you're good for a while. You don't necessarily have to do that every time if you're flat grinding. You're not putting a form on the, on the wheel. You don't have to do that a lot. So the short answer is yes, it's really easy to do. Um, and now I'll explain why I think it is important and why you could end up pulling your hair out on trying to get rid of that last little little bit of uh, 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 what appears to be imbalance. Imagine that the wheel is tilted, okay? Uh, and if you look at it, go, go to the website and look at my balancing ring page, and there's a picture there. You do not have to imagine. Uh, the wheel was mounted up, and literally the resulting wheel was like this, okay? And I dressed that wheel until it cleaned up with the diamond, okay, on both sides. And what happens is if you have a wheel rotating and it's doing this, okay, and now you've, you've trued the bottom. So the bottom is going, is dead true, but it keeps moving like this with each rotation. As you are coming in to your new material, your wheel is cutting, not cutting, cutting, not cutting, cutting, not cutting. What does that look like? Okay. So when you're all done and you hit it with the PFG stones and you see your high spots, you go, what? I, I balanced, I trued, I did all the good stuff. But once you, now, you, you dress both sides of the wheel, even if the hub of the wheel is tilted, the wheel is now spinning dead true. It's not, it's not moving, it's not doing this. Okay, so now you've trued the bottom, you've trued the sides, and now it should sound like, it just, you know, as it's grinding, it should sound perfect. So try that. Um, so the short answer is, yeah, you have to, you have to true the side of your wheel. Uh, almost machining says for surface finish has a ton of factors. Absolutely true. Bart, what was the finish issue you were seeing? The problem may not be from the wheel. Okay. So almost brings up a very good point. Um, it could be bearings. It could be motor balance, right? Uh, so it's unlikely that the balance of your spindle changed. Yeah, you guys are in violent agreement here. Um, it's unlikely that the balance of your spindle changed, but your, your motor, um, it could have thrown a balancing weight. It could have thrown a chunk of the goop that they use. Uh, it, almost machining knows exactly what I'm talking about. The, the, the goop that they use in the motor to, to affix the windings that, you know, it could have thrown a chunk of that. A lot of things, it could be a buildup of gunk in the motor. A lot of things can contribute to the motor being out of balance. Once the motor is out of balance, you're, you're in the front of the machine trying to, trying to make the world right, and that is finding its way into your wheel. That's something you should think about. And um, uh, what was the last thing I was gonna uh, mention? I guess that's about it. Also, I'm assuming, and, and this is something that I advocate for, that your um, your hub lives on your wheel. You're not taking wheels off of your hubs. Please confirm that this is true. Uh, once a once a wheel goes on a hub, it stays on that hub. I, I use the word hub. Other people say adapter. Um, but it stays on the adapter until that wheel's used up and, and done, or you're sick of it and you just want to get take it off. So that's another important thing. If you think you can maintain true and balance and all that good stuff, taking a wheel on and off a hub, not happening. In my in my opinion. I did I did I do it, Bart? Confirm. Okay, good. Almost also asks hydraulic gear rack or belt drive for the table. Oil film on the ways. Travel speed. 
Well, travel speed inherently isn't going to add to, to that, but it, it's a factor. Wheel type and material. You can get wheel skip on certain materials because you could have the wheel build up and not cut and then cut, not cut. If you, if you load up a wheel, that can happen or, or that the process of loading up a wheel. So that, that's all true. Let's just assume that that's okay. Um, so I had, my first grinder was a Harrig 612 and it had rack and pinion on the table. And my mentor, John, said, um, some people don't like the rack and pinion because you can see the rack uh, in, the, in, the, in the surface. Because if you think about the gear, there's some amount of up being put on the rack as in addition to the over, right? So as you turn that handle, you're driving that, that um, pinion and it's pushing the rack but there's some vector upward in addition to the vector over. Uh, that can leave a pattern. The diagnostic for that is as you come across the work and you hit it with, you know, when you're done, you hit it with the PFG stones and you see those microscopic high spots. If they all line up, that's the rack and pinion. Okay. Or, Probably is the rack and pinion. Um, and then I, I see your question, Tuck. We're going to hit it next. And then if you have a belt drive and it's a toothed belt, kind of the same thing. So anytime when you look at those high spots and, and you, you're doing multiple passes and you're all done, if those high spots line up, it's not out of balance. <laughs> Because out of balance is going to be pretty random. I, I doubt you're going to be able to hold phase <laughs> going both ways with your spiel, spin, uh, wheel spinning uh, 3,600 RPM. So look at the look at the pattern and, and see if from pass to pass those lines are in phase or out of phase. Because if, if they're all in phase, it, it, it could be the rack and pinion. Now... It also could be bearings. You could have bearings bumping over the same spots as they go past, and you could have a you could have a, 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 a bearing problem. Or even if it's flat, you know, V ways and V and flat ways, you could uh, you could have a a booger <laughs> on your ways. So. But the key there is just look at your passes and see if, if the high spots line up. If the high spots line up, it's not your balance. Um, and slip stick can also play a, play a role there. Good point. What happens to wheels if you are trading hubs? Of course, needs redressed. Any other side effects? You have to redress. You have to rebalance. So... You basically have to treat it like a brand new wheel. Now, can you get away with not doing that? Yeah. If, if you want to accept a lower quality of grind, that's not a bad thing. If, if, if you're going to just sling material off it, sure. But if you change hubs, you rebalance, you retrue. And... To, I don't. I won't accept any other answer. So once that hub is on there, appropriately torqued, as we talked about last week, it lives there. And if that, and if you're saying, "Well, what is it? that means," I have to buy five hubs. Yes, you do. Um, and if I, if 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 you have an argument with that, let me hear it. A whole bunch of people just joined. Welcome. I don't know why all of a sudden, but you're absolutely welcome. Fat Rad Cater. Fad Radcator, I take exception to you calling us gentlemen. But uh, we'll uh, let it ride for now. So these are all good, these are all excellent questions. But I call it reading the tea leaves. T. Sanchez Morales, welcome. I call it uh, reading the tea leaves. You know, when you look at the pattern that your, uh, <laughs> that your uh, grind leaves, it, it's telling you all sorts of information. And don't just look at it. Um, let me see if I have something that shows 
something with some pattern on it. That's not mine. Um, yeah, let's let's see. This is this one's really hard to see. Yeah, I, I <laughs> I'm looking for something that I ground like a couple of years ago when I knew a lot less than I know now. This one's pretty, this one you might be able to see. All right, so ignore the step. There's a step in the block that's there for a reason. Let's see if I can get you to see this. It's really hard to show you. Anyway, this one is very streaky. And as I look at it, I could tell that my wheel was not properly dressed. Um, and I could also tell that I didn't, I didn't finish with more than one pass. If you, if you do a single pass, gentlewoman, how about gentle person or human? I'm going to go with human. If you do, you know, if you finish your grinding, you think you're finished, right? You've heard of the term sparking out. Um, but you do your last pass and you're done. You put your tools away. Uh, frequently later, you can look at the surface and say, that doesn't look so good. So your wheel will cut long after you think it's cutting. So the spark out passes uh, are important if that finish is is what's important to you. Um, and on the, on the uh, Okamoto, let me, let, me tell you, let me show you the hint that the Okamoto gives us that the spark out passes are, are important. Let me turn this around. Yeah. <laughs> spark out 15. <laughs> this is, this is uh, I know it says time. It really should say something like times, but it depends on the mode, so they use a, a weird word. But if you're doing sort of a, a traditional uh, grind and step over, grind and step over, um, this, after you finish a pass across your work, it will do a spark out. It, this is in semi-automatic mode, which is very similar to the, the ancient controls. And you can say, yeah, I want five spark out passes. Well, the reason there's five spark out passes or, you know, however many you want is for that because it actually does something. That's my point. It actually does something. So um, don't forget to spark out if, if you're going to be, you know, super critical about the surface finish later. You have to you have to do spark out, and I'll tell you another thing that the spark out pass does. Um, the spark out pass. Welcome aboard, everyone, or as we're going to call you from now on, humans. Uh, the spark out pass will tell you how your grind and how your machine are behaving. So if you do if you do your final pass and you take off a tenth. And then you go back to do a spark out. There's a number of things that can happen. This is very interesting. What if you go to do a spark out pass? And, and let's define spark out pass. A spark out pass means you don't touch the head height. You leave it exactly the way it was. And now you go back across the work. What if you see nothing happen? You see no you, you see no sparks. A, a vote in the comments. Do you think that's good or do you think that's bad? I'm waiting until I get at least four votes. You've just finished the pass. You took a tenth. <laughs> Fad Radcator, you're my kind of person. Uh, no, you can't tell quite yet. Not quite yet. But right now, you're not looking at the surface. You're looking at the sparks. That's an important distinction. 
you're looking at the sparks, you do your, your spark out pass, you, you've changed nothing, and there are no sparks. Fad Radcator says, it depends. Yes, it could be good. Anybody else? Hey, Inspiration Metalworks, you are an inspiration, sir. It depends, says almost. The wheel may be crushing the part down, or if there if there isn't enough heat to ignite a spark. I use flood, so what is a spark? Good. Okay, let me limit it to dry grinding. No coolant. Think about it. Good afternoon, sir. Okay, let me tell you what I think. Um, ideally, the pressure there, would you, would you agree with me that there's pressure from grinding? So your wheel is on a spindle. The spindle's attached to a column. The column is attached to the base. The base is attached to the work. So that looks like you think it's good on dry? Okay, excellent. So let's think about our grinder like a C-clamp, right? And um, I've heard the term, I like, I like the term kinematic loop. You look at the kinematic loop from the work into the base, up the column, out the spindle, through the wheel, back down to the work. That is the kinematic loop, right? So... When you're grinding, there's pressure on the wheel. Might not be a lot of pressure. If your grinder has a uh, low stiffness in its kinematic loop, okay, the term spring pass, right, that's where that term came from. When you go back with your spark out pass, it, a little bit of that spring is, is coming out. So in most cases, You've taken your last one-tenth pass, and now you come back with a spark out. I would expect sparks, okay? So let's, I'm going to branch the tree, sparks and no sparks. Let's say you got sparks. Um, are the sparks, re, read the sparks, look at the quantity of the sparks. Is it the same across the work? And if it's the same across the work, but it's only a couple of little sparks, that's a good grind, okay? So what if you go across the work and there's zero sparks? So let's think of it this way. What if you go across the work and you see B the sparks? I'm impressed. That's good. You see little sparks. We're in our spark out pass. Little sparks, little sparks. You're halfway across and they stop. And then they start up again. What did that tell you? I'll tell you what it tells me. Um, I got your question, uh, Mr. Morales. Morales. T. Sanchez Morales. Um, I will answer your question. So... Read the sparks. Get. <laughs> I think we need a T-shirt. Be the sparks. Read the sparks. Be the sparks. How's that? Okay, I have to write this down. Then we have to answer that question. You guys are awesome. Um, so in my mind, if I see the little sparks coming on my spark out and then I, then they stop in the middle and they start up again at the edge. I put heat into the part on my last pass so that the heat was, a, was able to get out easier at the edges and harder at the middle because the heat's got to get, go two ways. So you end up grinding a belly in your part and that spark out pass tells you Okay, you don't need any instruments. You don't need, I hate to say it, you don't need a PFG stone. 
you, you watch the sparks, and if you see sparks, no sparks, sparks, you had it. You have a belly in your part. Okay. So how you deal with that is another another discussion. So I contend that if you did your last uh, pass of a, where there was an actual cut, even if it was a tenth, and now you come in for a spark out pass and there's nothing, you might not be on size. You might have overheated the part, cut too much because the part expanded and you cut it, and then you went out to lunch, and then you come back. <laughs> okay, so this is something to think about. You have to read the read the tea leaves, uh, and and watch those sparks. So, a very tiny spark out where you're seeing consistent amount of sparks all the way across, but there's only like teeny amounts of them. Perfect, and now you can spark out. You know, 37 times if you want. And life is good. But those sparks are giving you information. It, that is not a nuisance. That is useful information. So um, that's my point. I hope I... And, and I don't want to sound like an expert. I'm not an expert. I'm the student of experts. Um, so I'm just passing that along. But it will tell you things. And I think that's probably in in, in grinding without coolant... So good, good point. Uh, almost that you brought up the coolant. In grinding without coolant, that is a, sort of the number one issue: is controlling that heat um, to the point where you might want to rough and then go out to lunch and then come back and start taking your tenths. And and now things will settle down, and and you could avoid putting too much uh, heat in, or you could spray the part with WD forty and then do your you know, a grind. So do what you got to do to deal with the heat. Does that help? By the way, Wales qualify for their first World Cup since 1958 after beating Ukraine 1-0. to zero. Well fought. This just in. All right. Uh, let's see. There was another question that I said we'll handle after we finish this. It was Mr. Webb. You don't have to call me that. I'll be in the area all day. Uh, do you have any experience with granite base machines and its relationship with, I'm going to assume you mean cast iron ones. Oh, with cast iron ones. Um, no, I'm sorry. I do not have any. Um, I understand them, but I've never had my hands on, is this true? Let me think. I don't think I've ever had my hands on a granite base machine. So I don't know. But I would assume... Oh, you know what? I'm not going to assume anything. Um, I know that the the uh, epoxy granite composite machines have a very high damping factor. And that's very desirable. Um, and I think they have a higher damping factor than cast iron. And the reason we like cast iron, one of the reasons... Yes, almost says when you leave for lunch, keep the machine running. Yeah, leave the spindle running. Absolutely, yes. And leave the hydraulic pump running. And you can even leave the table oscillating. Absolutely true. You want, you, you want to do um, stabilize your temperatures. Very good point. Uh, the reason we like cast iron is that cast iron has these nodules of iron and these these uh, uh, interstitial graphite and that whole structure is is a very highly damped whereas if you take a piece of steel you know um, even even just tapping this you could hear the ring right and if I had a piece do I have a piece of cast iron actually I do holy cow There's a little, there's a little ring, not a good experiment, but the, the, the granite composite materials have very high damping. Uh, damping means if you twang it, twang 
does it vibrate for a long time or a short time? Short time is high damping. Long time is low damping. Okay, so we want our machine to have high damping so that vibrations go away quickly. Okay? Cool. Welcome aboard. Um, I think I collected all the, the last questions. Any... Um, Lunch is cool down period, yeah. <laughs> but not too much, as we have pointed out. Any suggestions for a good book? You can also read German. Of course you can, sir. Um, uh, the fundamental, sitting on my table in my living room is uh, the, f uh, the machine precision book. Uh, fundamentals of machine uh, fundamentals fundamentals of precision the Moore book um, somebody give me the title I can't remember the exact title uh, fundamentals of accuracy is that what it is anyway the Moore book fundamentals of accuracy which they still sell uh, so sorry uh, almost says granite machines are more thermally stable as well. They still have a metal slide surface, unless air bearing, but at that level in most shops can be achieved by lapping for, yeah. So the the point is, is that the reason people are digging uh, granite is stability, but they also have high damping. Uh, so uh, book, good book to have. If you don't have, um, is it fundamentals of, Accuracy. If you don't have the more book, grinding books. Whew. I have a PDF of an ancient Norton tool room grinding book, which is surprisingly useful. Um, one of the one of the things that is different these days is some of the new materials, like like the Norton Five SG wheel. The gelled, what do they call it? Uh, gelled ceramic. I forget. There's a, a term of art. Yes, you know, st that stuff was just not around uh, in the '50s. But everything else in the book is it, you can you can garner a lot. So some of the old Norton books were outstanding. I'll tell you another thing: is go to YouTube. I know it's not a book, but go to YouTube and just look for videos from Norton and and they're. They're old videos. They're 30-year-old, 40-year-old videos. <laughs> it's not that old. Um, you'll find them on YouTube. And it's not centered. It's like gelled ceramic. They have some... I, yeah, I can't remember. I, yeah, I don't remember uh, what the name is. But the 5SG wheel, the 3SG wheel are all examples of... Uh, very modern materials. But really, the fundamentals of grinding are in the old books. <sighs> Any other questions? I, I don't have a zillion book recommendations. But I think those are... You know, an, the old Norton book and, and that, that more fundamentals book is just awesome. All right. It's 2.03. We're over the top of the hour. I'll look for a couple of questions, and then I think we're going to wrap it up. And I'm going to finish out my Sunday. I got caught up on orders. All the orders are out for the week. I did that kind of early in the week. Favorite ice cream flavor, Cherry Garcia by uh, um, Ben & Jerry's. Best ice cream flavor ever. I'm not eating ice cream these days, kids. <laughs> I'm trying to lose some. But yeah, Cherry Garcia. I have a lot of flavors I do like. There are very few I don't like, but Cherry Garcia stands out. Best combination ever. Two more questions. So as we, as we wrap this up, I just want to point out that I, I do not... Um, Thank you very much, sir. D 
Dot Nierbo says more foundations of mechanical accuracy. That's it. Foundations of mechanical accuracy. Yeah, good seeing you, sir. Hey, uh, yeah, that's the book. So uh, just to, to echo something I heard uh, come out of Robin's mouth, and I think this is worth repeating. Um, you know, he says, every time I have a question for him, he says, he says this. But it is true. I don't consider myself an expert. There, there are people that have uh, four decades of experience beyond me in the world of grinding, in the world of precision, and in the world of machining. So I am but a student. If I could pass on some of those teachings, I'm happy to do it. But I am just a student. The Ben and Jerry's fat content is why. That's true. But I'll tell you, it comes with the sugar content, and that's the problem. <laughs> uh, I, yes, I'm one of those guys that will eat fat and have no problem with it, but eating sugar is part of the problem. All right, guys. Hey, have an awesome rest of your weekend. Those of you in, you know, over the pond, it's uh, getting dark. Uh, and uh, have a good rest of your evening. Fad Radcater says it. Sugar bad. Is that the third line on our t-shirt? Read the sparks. Be the sparks. Sugar bad. I think I like it. All right, guys. Have an awesome uh, rest of your weekend and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Peace.